my name is Corey Kendrick. I'm on the policy research team at Uber, which means we use data science and mapping and economics to understand Uber's impact on cities. So not necessarily products, but the world itself. So you, how many of you actually take an Uber? I know we did a pool poll earlier. Push a button and you get a ride. We call it urban mobility at the push of a button. And in just five years, we've grown to transportation delivery, um, other low-cost products in over 450 cities around the world. So part of my team's job is to help tell that story of growth. And just a day or two of trips ends up making almost a map of the city itself, which is really cool. So I'm going to take you through some things we can learn about cities using Uber data. So here's one thing. What time do bars close? Turns out uh, Uber requests spike just about when last call is happening in, in bars. So let's look at a few cities here. You can see San Diego, Houston are 2 a.m. Salt Lake City is 1 a.m. And has anyone ever lived in Sydney? Yeah? Do bars ever close? Well, it looks like people never stop partying in Sydney. So there's, there's one fun fact about a city. Here's the second thing we can learn. How do people get around between different neighborhoods or even different cities themselves? So on the left here is a map showing how riders use Uber to go between different municipalities in the Ontario area of Canada. So those are totally different cities. And the edges in this network are the ones that send the most trips back and forth between each other. So it's a really cool sort of fingerprint of a region. And then sometimes when you're making maps and doing data, you make art by accident. Uh, you can see on the right here, this is a constellation of all the trips in the New York City area, aggregated up to the zip code level. And you can just see trips that are connecting between the top three other areas that they send trips to. So these are just two snapshots of how areas are connected using Uber data. And what else can you learn? Here's a heat map of trip drop-offs by tourists in Rio. And one aside here, we use hexagons because they tessellate really well on a sphere. So if you've done mapping, you know any 2D map is not a perfect representation of the real 3D world. But hexagons are pretty great for spheres, like a soccer ball. So we, we use those a lot in our visualizations. And we did the same map, actually, during the Olympics. And you can see more activity around the Olympics venues. OK, anyone have an idea what's going on here and what city it is? Not New York, not London. It's Mexico City. These are public transit lines. So one thing we try and look at is, are people using Uber to sort of go the last mile from the nearest public transit stop to where they're trying to go? So this is something my team's really interested in researching because not every transportation option can reach everyone's front door. You know this. Um, unless you live on top of a BART station here in SF, it's kind of hard to get around without multiple other options. But you don't always know if someone actually was getting on a train. So one thing we've done, we worked with Shen, who you'll hear from later to make this beautiful thing, um, is how do you tell if people are actually getting an Uber right after a train arrived? So these blue dots are Uber trips coming from the Caltrain station downtown. And the red dots that sort of spin out are when Caltrains were arriving. So it's kind of cool. It's very mesmerizing. You can watch the trips sort of spin out from when the train arrived, which is pretty cool. So this is our mission. You've heard this before. Transportation as reliable as running water everywhere for everyone. And it's kind of tricky to get to in 450 cities around the world. So I'll go through a few examples of how we talk about that growth story. So first, you create this platform for flexible work where drivers can be their own boss and work when they want to. It's easy to sign up and to drive. And in an example, Paris, we have over 14,000 drivers and over a third of them are under age 30 which is very different than the taxi population, which is about 12% under age 30. Another interesting thing is 25% of them were unemployed. So having this flexible option they can turn on and off is a really awesome option to have. And what happens is they start turning on the app and driving in their own backyards. And they often live in places that are called transportation deserts, which is where taxis, trains, and buses don't go. There's the growth. So let's look at what that looks like. Here are taxi drop-offs in New York City in 2015. There's this amazing data set. If you're interested in geospatial data, you should play with that. And so we wanted to look at how that compares to Uber. How does our service compare to taxi in New York? So here's us in 2012. We were just getting started. And in 2013, 
2014. And finally, where's it going to go? 2015. And comparing that to taxi, it's pretty cool to see that we really are serving these transportation deserts, which are the outer boroughs in New York. And so not only does our service get better sort of as we scale, but it also gets more convenient. So with more drivers available, you can decrease the amount of time you have to wait to get a car. So this is showing ETA areas in Los Angeles for five minutes or under and 10 minutes or under and how those have just continued to improve in the last three years or four years. And with this increased access and reliability, you also get increased affordability. So this map shows how far you could get for 500 Kenyan shillings in Nairobi. Let anyone know how much that actually is in US dollars? Five dollars, yeah, exactly. Um, but you can see after we did a rider side fare price cut, you can get much further. And here's a fun map thing you can do. You kind of shrink wrap the routes and get this isochrone that shows you the coverage area that you can get to with that amount of money from a common point. So this is New Orleans. So when you get to the scale where you can match more and more trips, you can get more people into fewer cars and make our streets less congested. And this is something policymakers at every level care a lot about. So this video, another Shen classic, which you will hear more about later, I'm sure. Um, I'm embarrassing her. So it shows what traffic would look like if all the Uber pool trips in San Francisco were actually solo UberX trips. So if people drove themselves or were in an UberX. This is a really cool way to demonstrate to policymakers just how a technology solution like this can really have an impact on cities. And part of my team's job is not just to understand how people are using pool to get around cities, um, how that's increasing mobility in these transportation deserts, but also what other impacts it can have. So one thing we did is looking at if Uber riders had driven alone instead of sharing their ride, they would have driven another 312 million miles, and that's across all of our pool cities. And that would have consumed over 6 million more gallons of gas and emitting 55,000 metric tons of CO2. So this is our goal at Uber, transforming cities and making transportation as reliable as running water for everywhere for everyone. What I showed you today are just a few examples of how we try and use data to help tell that story. And this is the cities that we're in. We're still growing. Um, we're in over 70 countries, which is super exciting. And we'll continue to study the impact that we're having. So I look forward to meeting you later. Come say hi. Thank you.